I'm back. Back like I never left. First of all, I want to say thank you to everybody that subscribed. Everybody that's watched my videos. Everyone that's commented. Thank you so much. Even just yesterday, I got seven new subscribers. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate the support and your belief in me, in it. That you will subscribe to my channel and you'll watch my videos. Thank you very much and I'm going to do my best for you. That's the reason I said it's important for me to do this video. You know, because, you know, Ultimate Warrior died two weeks ago. And I've been really sad about that. I've been inconsolable. You know, I feel like I've been like somebody that's had a breakup with their girlfriend. You know, and just listening to music and eating and all that kind of stuff, man. Since Ultimate Warrior died. I've just been sad. You know, listening to The Seven Lions one more time. Godlike tune. Magical, magical song. I love that song. It was they used it in the tribute for The Ultimate Warrior on Raw last week. And it was magic. It's helped me, man. It's helped me. You know, when I've been doing my press ups, when I've been sleeping, when I've been sad, I just think about The Ultimate Warriors being dead. I love that character. I love The Ultimate Warrior. So that song has helped me. The music video. I watch that music video. All the time, the Ultimate Warrior tribute. I watch it all the time, and it's helped me through the week. And now I'm feeling better. You know, I'm still sad. I'm still cut up about it because he meant a lot to me. He was a childhood hero of mine. That's why it meant so much to me. You know, I was raising the, the era, the golden era of wrestling with Sting, Big Van Vader, British Bulldog, Ultimate Warrior, Hulk Hogan, Macho Man Randy Savage, Tito Santana, Stunning Steve Austin. Bam Bam Bigelow, Razor Ramon, Sid Vicious, Jamie the um, Jamie Boy Smith, Jimmy the Anvil Nightheart, Brett the Hitman Heart, you know, as I said, Dricky, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, Pat Patera. I was raised in that era of wrestling. So for somebody from my childhood, a hero of mine that gave me the ethic of guts and hard work and be passionate. If people can't understand you, because Ultimate Warrior wasn't about his articulation or his words. He was trying to relay his spirit. The passion was his, what he was trying to relay. That's why when he taught, it never technically made sense through the mouth. But it was the feeling, the spirit. He was trying to relay his spirit to you. So when he said the essence of Ultimate Warrior will always live on, the spirit right here, that touched me right there. So the fact that Warriors. He said that. It's made me stronger now that I'm I'm able to just keep going and do what I'm doing. So yeah, Ultimate Warrior, Seppos for you. Warriors. Love you, love you, Warrior. So, Amazing Spider-Man Two. It's a very very good film. I loved it. It was an emotionally charged film. Let's be honest. It wasn't about the storyline. The main storyline. The storyline of the film was basically you had Electro, who played was Max Dillon, got electrocuted at work. Nobody paid attention to this guy. Nobody cared about him. Nobody even knew his name was Max. He fell into a pit of water filled with genetically modified eels, and that's how he became Electro. And the main thing he wanted to do was get back at Spider Man because he felt like Spider Man betrayed him because there was one part. When Spider-Man helped save Max and told him, you're my eyes and ears out here. I need you, man. He felt like Spider-Man betrayed that and Spider-Man set him up. Like Spider-Man made him purposely look like a bad guy in order for him, Spider-Man, to look like the good guy, stopping the bad guy when he became Electro. And that's what led to his hatred because he's, you know, he's a little bit mentally unstable from people ignoring him and nobody caring about him in any way, shape or form. You know, so he was a bit warped that way. The way the love and the hate can change so rapidly. But you know, they say love and hate is one and the same. He hated Spider-Man and wanted to kill Spider-Man. That was the main story and he wanted to get power of the, the, of the national grid in order to control it because he designed it. He designed the schematics for the grid and, and, and controlled the whole electricity world. Something like that. Warriors. Harry Osborn was basically dying because his father died, but they have like a genetic mutation which will lead them to die sort of young. The only way he could be saved from death was through the blood of Spider-Man because all their human trials had failed to mutate humans with 
this genetically modified serum. But this is where things change because Peter Parker's parents died. They showed their parents in this film. Now, if you know anything about the comic book, you know Peter Parker's parents were secret agents. They were doctors in a storyline, but the original story that I read, they were secret agents. They're the ones that got the Cosmic Cube from Red Skull and gave it to the S.H.I.E.L.D. That's how originally I thought they were going to be in the Avengers. But now you look at it, they can't be in the Avengers. Because they've completely written out the whole Cosmic Cube thing with Spider-Man. Okay, cool, no problem. So now we've seen what they're going to do with the parents. They made the parents into the people that helped Norman Osborn create. Because that's what um, Norman Osborn did at first. He had a monopoly over creating mutants and bioweapons to give to organised crimes to create all these kind of mad superheroes. That was in the comics, that was original, you know. <clears throat> like the Sinister Six, um, the Chameleon, Dr. Octo Octavius, M Mysterio, the Sandman, Rhino, and Electro. They were the members of the Sinister Six. I think that was, I think I got, I hope I got that right. They were even mentioned in the film, the Sinister Six. You know, so it's, it's brilliant. Like, the way they did, like, little shout-outs and things that could potentially happen in the future was really good, you know. The relationship Spider-Man had with Harry Osborn, it was really cool, you know. <clears throat> and I like, personally, being from a comic book, hardcore comic book reader, I like the way you didn't have Norman Osborn in the film. Because for me, what made me not like Gwen Stacy from the comic books was the fact that she slept with Norman Osborn and they had kids together and you know Spider-Man forgave her you know and all that kind of stuff like that really irritated me in the comic books that's why I never really liked her but in this film she came across very very well the relationship it's seemed as rocky as it was in the comic books you know because if you don't follow the comic books exactly you would have had Mary Jane Watson in there because Mary Jane Watson was a constant factor in their relationship you know it's just that she was random she was an on-road girl She's not the girl you take home to mum. That's the reason Peter Parker was never with her. She was Gwen Stacy first. And she loved Spider-Man first. And she went to him. And they became together. You know, the storyline with them going to London. That as well was in the comic books. She didn't actually go to London in this one. Because, you know, in the original comic books, Peter Parker actually went to London. Then he didn't need to go there because the power grid and Electro shutting down the whole of New York. But the film was still exceptionally good. It was such an emotional film. And that's what I feel they're doing in the Spider-Man films. They're making a film about a man, Peter Parker, who an ordinary guy, Peter Parker, that's been given extraordinary powers of the Spider-Man and him trying to make that together, you know, try to balance that out. Because the man doesn't steal, he doesn't rob, he doesn't get paid to be Spider-Man. He still has to hold down a normal, everyday job. And that's what's fantastic about Spider-Man. The man will fight the Jackal. And then from fighting the Jackal and saving the world, he will go to helping a child get her ball out of the tree. Nothing is too big. Nothing is too small. And that's why the people love Spider-Man. And you feel the heroness in this film. When he's going through the city, it's incredible. It's beautiful. The people love him. The visuals in this film, first of all, I'll say Max Dillon, I actually like this character. Jamie Foxx, the way he played Lecture was beautiful. Beautiful, I didn't expect it, I didn't expect it. My whole problem with the film was how are you going to have Spider-Man fight against a man made of electricity? No, they find a way past that. You know, Gwen Stacy helps him with the how to conduct the electricity that gets fired at him. You know, he laces his suit with copper wire and his webbing with copper wire so it doesn't fry and he can conduct the electricity and then they magnetize it because how they discharge, distill the charge. Um, and the, because batteries can maintain a certain amount of energy and that's how he's able to take bolts from Electro and able to hit him and everything. This, the film is so good, man. Like, even when he fights Electro, the last fight, not even the last fight, every fight he has with Electro is so cool. But like, in the last fight, when he's fighting him, Electro's firing his bolts, but as he's firing his bolts, you hear Electro music. And it's, it's, it's like, you know, Itsy Bitsy Spider. Itsy Bitsy Spider. Oh. I'm not doing it. Itsy Bitsy Spider. You, as he's doing it, you hear like an Electro version of Itsy Bitsy Spider as he's throwing bolts at Spider-Man. The Spider-Man's like, oh, I hate this tune as he's going about. And it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's really, really good film. Really, really well done film. 
And that's one th another one thing I didn't like was how they've rewritten Spider-Man's story of how he becomes Spider-Man. You know Spider-Man was bitten by an electro a, a radioactive spider on accident and obtained the powers. But now they're making it like it's his legacy. He was destined to get that power. You know, because as I told you, they've read they've taken the story of the of the parents being agents for SHIELD and getting the cosmic cube, and now it's just their scientists that work at Oscorp and they help make the biological weapons that Oscorp monopolize in order to create disorder and help organize crime so they can make more money and all this kind of stuff. You know, because that's what Oscorp originally was in the comic books. But what they've done is the genetic serum that only he can use was made out of using his blood. So only his son, Peter Barker, can use that. And he, they put it in the spiders, which basically says that he was leading Peter Barker to a path to get the serum so that he could become Spider-Man. If you follow the path of what I give you, because like he gave um, Peter Parker a case, a leather case, that had all the keys that would lead him to unlocking the secret of getting the Spider-Man ability and what his legacy was. So I feel like they've rewritten it because Spider-Man was never a prince that was going to obtain the Holy Grail of the King. It was never going to be. It was never that. So that one I didn't like, but it's still a good film. It was still very emotionally charged. It was very emotionally charged. Like the acting, I've never seen such powerful emotional acting in the film in my life. You actually felt for Peter Parker as a human being. The way you saw him sad and crying over losing Gwen Stacy and she dies in the film. She dies. She, she dies horribly. Like her head conks against the floor super duper hard. You know, and she's dead. You know, and you saw the impact it had on him. It was real. It wasn't like one second she's dead, the next second she was he was okay. Oh, she's dead, but I'm gonna keep on being Spider Man. It took because in the comic books it took him years to come back to being Spider Man, and they you felt the passing of time before he came back to being Spider Man, and he stepped up again, and you felt the passion for Spider Man. You liked the character. It was a very good film, man. Harry Osborn was very well portrayed as well. I loved the film. I love the film, it was very well done, the pacing was good, the script was good, the music was incredible, the soundtrack was godlike. The secretary that Harry made his secretary, her name was Felicia, and the Black Cat's real name is Felicia Hardy. So I think that that was Black Cat. You know, so they do do a lot of characters that they can't portray as characters in there, because you know, let's be honest, Felicia Hardy is a love interest of Spider-Man. I don't know if the way Spider-Man is right now, there's space for her. Although it would be cool to see a Black Cat film, but you can never do a Black Cat film without Spider-Man. So it's a very, very tough subject to address. I like the way she was in there. I like the way they implemented the Green Goblin, or the Hobgoblin, whichever you want to call him. So many people have taken up the mantle of Green Goblin. It was good to see the Hobgoblin. I didn't know if he was going to be in the film. I was actually surprised to see him in that film. And the way he looked, he actually looked really good. <laughs> he was actually really good the way he looked, the way he carried on. Um, he basically killed Gwen Stacy, if I'm honest with you. He was he did kill her. Because in the comic books, she did die to Norman Osborne. Norman Osborne killed her. You know, he dropped her off the bridge. You know, but in that in the comic books she snapped her neck. In this one, she just hit her head on the floor. Ooh. Like, she died. She died. Like, when he grabbed her with her webbing, she died. With the way her head hit the floor. Another thing I want to address, the way he handled her death. Because let's be honest, in the whole of Spider-Man, we all know that was Spider-Man's darkest hour. He actually quit being Spider-Man because of that. You know, he let Ben Riley. was it that, that late? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. Sorry. I mean, him and Ben Riley were actually friends. Sorry. This is why the review's hard for me. Because it's very hard for me to separate the film from the comic books. Because they intertwine so many storylines into one story. By taking bits from other bits. But they do it well. I'm not criticising. They do it extremely well. You know, but that's a bit of the problem. But the way they did it was very well when she died and the way Spider-Man handled her death you know because he did go missing for years and he came back because he had realized he had a responsibility and that means her death would have been meaningless if he quit being Spider-Man so it was very well executed 
there will be a Spider. I don't know if there'll be a Spider-Man three. I hope there is a Spider-Man three, but we'll see. So I would say that this film was a very, very solid film. Very emotional. Very. It felt positive. It was actually a positive film, and this tough, especially after Captain America. But Captain America has set such a huge precedence in the bar that has to be performed now by Marvel films that I didn't think Spider-Man was going to step up and it did, it actually did exceptionally well especially so soon after Captain America I mean, you know they say when it rains it pours and when it rains it definitely pours, especially with this Spider-Man if you don't like the reboot, you probably wouldn't like this film you know, but I think regardless of whether you like the reboot or not this film on its own is a very good film it's the most single most incredible adaptation of Spider-Man the portrayal of Spider-Man and the Peter Parker character not talking about the actual main story talk about Peter Parker and his story and his journey and his battle with being a superhero a normal guy having superhero powers and using that power for good just that so sounds cliche but it's executed so wonderfully that it's such a good film it was a really really good film but it's an acquired taste it's an acquired taste i would recommend you see it me personally i would give this film electro was good spider-man was good the emotional content of the film and the character the way they had on each other was exceptional i would give this film an eight out of ten an eight out of ten and an eight and a half out of ten eight and a half it was a very good film, exceptionally good film, it was solid. There was plot holes, the reason I will give it eight, an 8.5 eight out of 10 was because of the way they rewrote Spider-Man's story. They basically turned a pauper into a, a, a man that was basically a pauper who basically had his powers because right place, right time, you know, into a man that was destined to be where he was and obtain the power that he got because his father led him there and that's how they've changed him JCK changed him from being he was now he's a prince that was led to getting obtaining the holy grail and becoming spider-man because it was his destiny his legacy that his father left was for him to become spider-man and that's not true just that and that's the reason I'll give it an 8.5 out of 10, or else I would have given it a 9. But, solid film. Go watch it, go check it out. Thank you for watching this review. I know I've gone on a little bit, but as, again, I want to say thank you very much to everybody that subscribed. Everybody that continues to subscribe and comment on my videos and say positive advice and feedback. Thank you so much. I can't express how grateful I am for all your support. I'm going to continue to do my best. And I'm sorry that I didn't do a video in four weeks. But I only want to do videos on stuff that I'm passionate about so I can talk better about it. And you know, Ultimate Warrior dying, you know, it did, it did mess me up a little bit. You know, so I couldn't do the video as soon as I watched the film. But I hope you, the film's already out. Hope you go watch it. Hope this helps you. And until my next video, you beautiful people, be cool and stay happy.